Tomorrow. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean tomorrow? <laughs> Are we supposed to just chat now? Well, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could, I could, I could make a few points, and sure. we can just open it up uh, from there. Um, so much of this is is boring to me, and I think the photographer <laughs> got got boredom on my face. I've been hearing the same things about the internet and Google since 2003. I work at an institution of science and technology. And science and technology means something. We have to understand what the technology is. To cite Gutenberg, Gutenberg printed the junk mail of the 15th century called indulgence coupons. And in in a personal divide, it, I, I point out that it takes 60 years before a new, we understand how to use a new medium. But the thing about what Steve said is I agree with much of it, but it's just one truth. And there are multiple truths in the world that we have to deal with. It is true that bloggers did this or cell phones do that, but where are the reporters in the street? We don't see anything about the disenfranchised. They're not out there. The register started paying for productivity, Ken. And Ken writes uh, obituaries in his spare time for money. No, he doesn't. Yeah. No more? Like that was my dream job. That was your dream job. <laughs> I, I thought you were telling the truth when you told me that that's what you're doing. I said that was my idea. Yeah. Well, it doesn't, you know, the, what, what we're doing, I'm going to be writing, I'm going to be working with computer science department, some of the best minds in virtual applications, reali virtual reality applications center. And what we really need to do is to teach K through 12, and, and we're going to be writing a, a multi-million dollar, well, multi, well, a million dollar, we hope, uh, grant to the National Science Foundation called uh, Technology Uses and Abuses. So when you hold up a cell phone, you know that it's the Borg of technology and has assimilated everything. I mean, I'm not a Luddite standing up here. I've predicted what was going to happen. And read the book. It's still printing. It was written in 2004. It's still selling. I'm being asked, and some people here have said it. So what we really want to know is this. I dislike reading about AIDS. Do you know that? I just like reading about horror. But when I used to pick up the Des Moines Register, I, I knew if I needed to find out about it, it was there. That's what we're trying to resurrect. Stuff that we don't necessarily want to read until we have to read it, and then we need to find it. So those are just some of my thoughts. And in fact, you guys just talk about it. It's important that you do. But what we need to do is find, if Steve or anybody else had an answer to monetize new media, they'd be millionaires who wouldn't be working here in Iowa, all right? When somebody knows how to do it, let's just share it because I'm enjoying what Rasha said. I want my journalism, our journalism students get more of a, a taste of Watergate working for this gentleman right here on the daily than they do when they work for the professional media. And I want that zeal, Steve, that you will meet in our students to be used for the good of society. I don't want it to be used for Twitter or Facebook. There are two, and these poor students here have the largest debt load in the country. And their their credit cards are ID cards. Their ID, their, their, their ID cards are, are debit cards. And until we can figure out, oh, and Google, Google, the last time I checked, and they have recently hired some more, but they've downsized, had 10,000 employees. Did you hear that? They brought in revenues of $25 billion, or $2.5 million per employee. Don't tell me about how wonderful Google is until you do the research on how it downsizes everything it touches. Our, in our age, it downsized the assembly line. Now we're downsizing people. So yeah, I worry about it, but I don't have it. The answer that I have to it is education. And we, we work at a great institution of science and technology, and I think the answer is here. If y'all could raise your hands if you have any questions so I can bring it around so everybody can hear what's going on. That would be great. Go on. Okay. Um, I just have a question on how you guys think that, like, Facebook, Twitter, MySpace, like, how you think that has affected journalism? Like, if journalists use that, 
as an advantage or if you guys think it's a disadvantage to journalists or if they use it in any way to research or find people, just how you guys think that they use those social networking websites. Sh journalists should use every tool available uh, <coughs> that, that, that we can to get the news and to spread the news. And, and Twitter is, is perhaps the most powerful tool that I've seen developed in my career. Uh, and cell phones are more powerful than Twitter. I'll take that back. Because you can use your cell phone to Twitter. Um, <laughs> the, and and the, you know, the truth is there's a lot of crap on Twitter. Um, but there's a lot of crap in conversation, too, and we use that tool as well. Um, the, uh, I, there, if you remember in December, there was a plane crash. It crashed on takeoff in Denver. Uh, nobody was killed, so it wasn't huge news, but it was, it was the big story of the day. And, and I took a look. I, I blogged about this. You can find it on my blog in December. Um, I looked at both of the, the plane was bound for Houston. So I looked at the websites of the Houston Chronicle, the Rocky Mountain News, when it was still alive, and the Denver Post, and I looked on CNN. And they all had, you know, the NTSB says this, and, you know, the airline says that. Uh, they didn't get actual passengers until several hours later, or actually the second day on the newspapers, because even, even with their websites, their, most of their stories, other than the first bulletin, were, were basically their print stories. Um, well, those of us on Twitter knew within m minutes uh, that a guy whose Twitter username was two drinks behind, I can't remember his actual, I think his actual name was Mike Wilson, but that might be one of the Beach Boys. But, um, that was love, whatever. He, he was right. not two drinks behind. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's, right, that's true. <laughs> Um, whose first tweet upon the plane crashing was, holy fucking shit, I was just in a plane crash. Now, we might not quote that in my newspaper, but we sure want to talk to that guy and get his first-person account. And if you kept following his tweets, uh, you could see that this was the second plane crash this guy had survived. I, sh I want to read Ken Fusen's story on Two Drinks Behind. It'll cost you. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I didn't read that in any of those three newspapers or CNN, but I read it on Twitter. I also read that they heard, uh, I also saw his Twit pic, which wasn't a very good picture, frankly. Uh, the, the pictures were better on the, uh, but, but when the plane landed in the Hudson, the first and best picture I saw was a Twit pic picture taken by somebody on the ferry that went to rescue those people standing on the wing. And when I kept reading Two Drinks Behind's Twitter stream, I, I saw him complaining that they herded everybody into, I think it was U.S. Airways, I can't remember what the, or maybe it was, I think it was Continental, herded him into the, you know, the, the first class lounge, you know, where, where I don't get to spend much time. And, but he was whining that they wouldn't give him free drinks, you know, after they've survived this plane crash. <laughs> that was a great first person account that should have been in the press. But I got it on Twitter. And after... I and others blogged about that. Uh, the, the papers caught up, and I kept reading Two Drinks Behind's Twitter feed, and he was, he was getting a lot of interviews the day after and the day after that and so on. Um, but Twitter is a, 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 a marvelous tool for lots of journalistic purposes. Um, and, and journalists who aren't use, figuring out how to use Twitter and Facebook and Flickr and YouTube and other social media tools are their several drinks behind in, in staying up in this digital age. Here, here's what bothers me about, about some of this. I, I think it's great that you can go on Facebook and get sources for stories, and I believe Steve, when he talks about Twitter was great in this plane crash, but I think there's so many gizmos and tricks now that reporters are expected to do. You know what it keeps them from doing? Reporting. And, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's gotten to the point where you know, you're expected to go out and write a blog and twit. Is that the, is that the tweet, word? Tweet, 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 twit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, twit. <laughs> uh, uh, whatever you're supposed to do. All this t is time that you could be making another phone call, checking out a fact, or thinking. We've removed thinking from the reporting process. And you know why? Here, here's, here's the real, what's really going on here. It's what, it's what uh, Angie talked about, about value and ratings. 
We've turned newspapers. Hits are now the same as Nielsen ratings used to be. All we care about is the number of hits we get. We don't care whether it's from cute dog pictures or Twitters or racist comments under a news story or anything. All we want is the traffic. And you know what's missing from that equation? Any sort of news judgment whatsoever. So I don't mind Twitter and all the rest of this crap as long as it has something to do with news. Well, let me give you. But I, don't, I don't think it does. Let I'll me give you an illustration of that. Uh, in the early 1980s, Ken and I are kind of old. Um, the monks were doing the paper then <laughs> by yeah, hand. Yeah, <laughs> Ken, Ken, Ken was a reporter and I was an editor when a tornado hit Pleasant Hill uh, right outside Des Moines. And, and I can't remember if Ken was the reporter I sent to the site. I think you were working back in the, in the newsroom and the cops reporter went to the site. But Ken got out the old city directories, and, and your age students may not know what a city directory is, but that used to be where you found addresses uh, and phone numbers of people you could call. And, and we used that all the time because that was a good way to, to find people who might have been an eyewitness to that tornado. If you're thinking today, eh, you need to think Twitter might be a way that I can find people who were near that. And, and you can find it in seconds. And Ken is absolutely right. Twitter or any tool shouldn't be a, seek, a substitute for good reporting. If you remember when I was talking about that, I said I wanted to read the story Ken wrote after talking to, to Drinks Behind. So it needs to be a tool that you use with every other tool in your journalist toolbox. But what, it's, but what it's really used for is to keep you from actually doing that work, is what most of it is used. It's like romance. Uh, I, just saw, I just saw Steve's wife's Twitter page tonight. I looked at it. And it wasn't about news. It was about gossip, which is what most of us use oh, that sure. kind of, sort of stuff for. Sure. Well, that's but time that you're not, and I'm not uh, picking up, she's not a reporter. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> most of us are using it to say, hey, I went to the laundromat. You know, no. it's not, we're not using it for reporting. I would like to add Sp one, uh, one other perspective Please. to this, too, and what concerns me about social networks. Um, I'm one of those that's a few drinks behind because I do not have a Facebook page. I do not Twitter. I do not Flickr, any of these. Um, and I sometimes think to myself, when am I going to wake up one day and say, damn, I should have been doing this a long time ago. But what concerns me is when we use these tools as journalists is how can I – gauge the validity of two drinks behind and that's my biggest concern anybody can post something on Facebook anybody can tweet about whatever they want I just recently watched a piece on oh I forget if it was A&E or whatever it might have been but a woman and I forget her name I apologize but um, she claimed to be a victim of 9-11 she got tremendous press coverage out of this um, she formed a survivors group she was probably on every major network and every major newspaper, and she was a flat-out liar. And that's probably what concerns me the most, um, especially when you think about the emotional toll that that took on some of those families and the fact that she was posing and claiming to have this same grief and um, struggle with losing. I don't believe she claimed to have lost, or you know, she claimed to have lost coworkers, and she was pulled by someone, you know, from the burning building and this amazing rescue, and it was all a lie. And that's probably one of my greatest fears. I think they are great tools for finding people because, Steve, you are right. I mean, you try to find somebody's phone number now to do a personal account of their story, good luck. I mean, you have to find another way of reaching them, but I guess I can't stress enough the importance of not just picking up on that tweet and saying, all right, we got to go with this, instead of doing your homework and making sure that this guy's really, you know, true to what he's saying. If, if you read on my blog my, my um, uh, tips for journalists using Twitter, I, I should point out that one of the points I make is that, that, that the principles of verification apply using that as they do with any tool. Uh, one, of the, one of the many outstanding series that Ken wrote in his career at the Des Moines Register was a, a series called The Truth About Bot. Is that the correct name for it? And, and one of the things that Ken did was he debunked years' worth of media stories, pre-Twitter, pre-Internet stories of journalists who didn't verify their facts in telling Bob's stories, right? Am I remembering yeah. this correctly? Uh, so, so Twitter in the hands of a bad journalist will re result in the same sort of nonsense that Ken debunked in, truth, in the truth about Bob. Twitter being used by a good journalist 
will get us that story of two drinks behind uh, when everybody else is just reporting the official statements of NTSB and FAA and, those, and the airlines. Because the fact is, he was actually three drinks behind. Because <laughs> <laughs> they weren't giving him free drinks in the lounge. <laughs> The time he took the twit, he yeah. had another drink. Yeah, I mean that. Tweet, the, 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 the fact that he tweeted that he wasn't. Twit yeah, the <laughs> fact that he tweeted that he wasn't drinking was a good thing for whatever reporter <laughs> would connect with him because you got to be careful when they are. I guess I would say, as a magazine journalist, I have to say that for finding a source, I've never used any of those mediums to find a source. I feel like magazines, we have the time to track down a credible source, um, experts in the field, and we have time to do that long-term reporting. Um, maybe, you know, I've found a source online or found a source through those, but never once have we ever taken information from an online medium and cited it as credible in the magazine. So I think there's a big difference there in the, t the length of time that we have to prepare stories as to newspapers and TV. And I think that's probably my greatest concern, you know, when I stress that is there is so much pressure and, and demand on us today to constantly be updating. I mean, we no longer have a deadline. I mean, every time something is coming in, we need to be generating and putting that up on the web. And I agree. I mean, these <coughs> social networking outlets are, are a great way to find some fantastic stories. But I, I just fear that in that pressure in the newsroom, and Ken, as you touched on, you know, you need to be doing this and multitasking right. beyond your means. That to get to get the hits, which goes to his question, aid stories don't generate hits. So why do we need to do them? You know, that's, that's, the, that's the question for newspapers. And I really worry that they're going to say, you know, we'd much rather do a story about how to date a cheerleader because that's going to really drive traffic uh, instead of this story about the uh, people are really tired of this bunkhouse with a mentally retarded man. It's, it's, a, it's a great question. I don't, I don't know. I, I think, to their credit, most news organizations still do the stories that people don't want to read, but the pressure's there. It certainly is there. When I was in high school, I was the editor-in-chief of our high school paper, and we never really talked about PR or the importance of advertising um, or the changing game that journalism always is. And I guess I kind of had an idea that there would be a, just an easy track to go to college, get my degree, and then just start writing for a paper. Um, and I'm seeing now that there's, uh, just among the publications here at ISU, some uh, are really good at getting people to pick up their paper uh, or their magazine to get people to read it, and others are absolutely horrible. And uh, whether they're good magazines or not, the story is wrong. And, I, and I've also noticed just through Facebook, ironically, that uh, back in my high school, some of them are using Facebook groups and Facebook event reminders to, um, to spread uh, PR uh, for their own publications. And so my question is just, what do you guys think that students, uh, both high school and in college, should be, uh, that we should be teaching them right now about the future, about, like, should we just be teaching them what journalism is to get them excited about doing it, or teaching them about the changing game and uh, all that stuff? I, w I wouldn't... Uh, I wouldn't dwell heavily in teaching journalism on today's business model because it won't last. Uh, that certainly needs to be covered, but uh, if, if I were a journalist now, I would concentrate on the, the skills of gathering facts and verifying facts and the skills of telling stories in multiple ways with multiple tools. And that means with, uh, with words and the, the, the outstanding narrative forms that, that Ken has mastered. That means with video. It means with interactive databases and multimedia. Uh, it, it means all the storytelling tools that are available to us. So if, if you learn to gather facts and you learn to tell stories in a variety of ways, uh, I think that you will have a promising future once the... Uh, uh, once somebody figures out the business model of the future, and it may not be newspaper publishers, it may be folks like Josh Marshall and Talking Points Memo, but it may be a combination. I, I work for a newspaper company because I believe we are going to figure it out, and, and I'm trying to help figure it out. 
but uh, uh, I think there will always be a demand for people who are good at gathering and verifying facts and, 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 and finding the stories and telling them well. I, I hope they don't get too far away from the basics of uh, you know, what a story is, how to report it fairly accurately, um, how to take competing claims and try to figure out who's telling the truth. I think they do all that. But I'm going to tell you, what Steve just said is right in this respect. Um, you are doing yourself a disservice if you're interested in being a reporter and you can't offer, if you can't say to the editor, I can take photos, I can do videotape, I can blog, I can tweet, twit, whatever you want to call it, I can flick or whatever the hell that, I don't even know what that is. Uh, I can go on Facebook. They are, they are obsessed right now with digital journalism, and the more you can offer them in that regard, the better. So if you don't know how to do videotape and, and get it online, have a friend show you how to do it, because they're gonna want that, you know. And not only are they gonna want it, you're going to have to do it, because the staffs have gotten so small, there isn't right. a choice. So if you wanna have a job and you wanna make a living as a journalist, you need to be able to bring all those skills to the table for them to hire you over somebody who can do all those, because they can't afford to employ three or four different journalists to do that job. It needs to be one person, and that's how companies are making their ends meet. Let me, before Angie talks, just tell you, my la one of my last stories I did for the Register was covering the Iowa State Fair, and I was telling them at dinner tonight, we had a photographer there who was taking still photos with one hand and video vi and, and taping it video with the other hand, and I said next year they'll have symbols attached to his leg so people can throw quarters at him uh, <laughs> to raise revenue. So that's the sort of, that's the sort of pressure you're going to be under for to produce. There's really nothing more I can add to that. I mean, I can only agree um, in terms of being, unfortunately, all things. Um, it's just the way it's going, unfortunately, because as they all said, smaller staffs, um, having that flexibility. I mean, a newspaper is just not the print form. It's video, it's sound, it's pictures, it's all, you know, everything. And I, I should add that in my first job out of college in uh, 1976, um, I was taking notes, writing stories, taking pictures, writing the headlines, you know, so, so multitasking is also a, a strong journalism tradition. I'm glad I didn't have to do video because my video really sucks. And it's not Im impossible, I think it's just work. And I think that's something that journalists have maybe gotten a little lazy with being able to use the internet to find sources and being able to use the internet, you know, to track down stories that appeared in magazines, but you can find them online. I think it is a lot of work now, but it's, de I mean, it's definitely worth the work. You just have to be willing to do it. I'm not, so I, I explained <laughs> that earlier. I like not working. <laughs> we had a question down here. So for those of us who have been trained in print journalism, and as all of you have, it kind of brings you on the end, um, I feel that we're really enamored with these long form uh, pieces. You like to see your byline on top of something that's, you know, 2,000 words if possible. It's, it's a great feeling, and in magazines specifically, um, you know, that's still common. But for our generation, my generation, um, the upcoming trend is to read two paragraphs, get bored with it, and toss it out. And I know that's how I read, which is unfortunate because I like to write long stories. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a bad idea. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of wondering what the aversion to, uh, you know, to short form journalism is. For instance, um, CNN.com often gets labeled as a, as a MIC journalism kind <laughs> of idea. Um, I've been in marketing classes where that's been the term that's used. It's, it's, it's MIC articles, it's short form, the depth really isn't there. Um, but today I also saw that CNN is vying for the top position on Twitter wi for the first um, tweet to reach one million, uh, I don't know, Twitter people? Followers. Uh, Ashton Kutcher. Twits. Twits, yeah, <laughs> twits. Ashton Kutcher has challenged them um, to beat him there. And those are the two top people above Britney Spears on Twitter right now. Ashton so Kutcher of Cedar Rapids, I should Right, say. of Cedar Rapids. So CNN News, um, news specifically, not their other content. Ashton Kutcher, Britney Spears, three top Twitter, Twitter people, is short form what we're looking for right now? And if so, um, is, our gen is my generation gonna be the people to do this or are you guys gonna adapt before we do? I, I, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. For, first of all, during the campaign when he was, or when somebody was Twittering actively for him, Barack Obama had the most followers on Twitter. So it's, it's, not, it's not just fluff, it, it's, you know, it, it's serious stuff. I, I should also, say that one of the most valuable uses I find for Twitter, which if you're not familiar, gives you 140 characters to make a point, and that's about 21 words. Um, one of the most useful ways that I find for using it is to find links to long form thoughtful things about the business that I'm in or the community that I live in. So um, 
a, a, good, a great story is a great story is a great story. Um, and uh, I have been to several, to a few uh, Neiman narrative conferences where I hear again and again and again the, the spike in internet traffic that a powerful narrative series brings. And I presume, Ken, that you've had some of that experience with some of your work at the Register. When the Hamilton Spectator in Ontario, Canada, was considering a, a, a serialized story in a novel fashion, but it was all factual and, and every, every detail verified, about a, ser a doctor in their community who was a serial killer. He was from India and kept going back to India to marry a new wife and bring her to Hamilton and poison her. Uh, fabulous story uh, for a journalist, um, not for the wife. But um, <laughs> it, it, they, they were going to run it in 31 parts. And the circulation manager on the print side was saying, are you crazy, 31 parts? And the, the Internet folks were saying, you know, people don't really go with narrative, long-form stuff online, attention span, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it drove record traffic, and it drove record print sales. Uh, by about the third week, the circulation director was thinking, do we need to stop after 31 days? Can we find another wife or something? A great story is a great story is a great story. And people like to read great stories wherever they can find them. And one of the great things about great stories on online is the viral way that they spread. That it's not just the people in Ames that read your great story here. Uh, they send a link to their friends all over and you get hits from all over. See, I, I used to believe that. I don't believe that anymore. I don't, I don't, think, I don't think a great story is necessarily going to get read if it's in, the, in a newspaper, if it's long. I, I agree with you that most people want two paragraphs or on Twitter they want one sentence and that's about and I think, I, at least, I think it's the medium. I think that they're going to look for that kind of work. The longer work, the more satisfying to me uh, stories in books and magazines. That's why I, I'm basically wanting to get out of newspapers. I, could, I felt like a dinosaur with some of this stuff. I want to believe what he just said. I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's, uh, it's true. I'm actually, my new goal now after tonight is I want to do the first Twitter narrative serial of one set. You know, he grabbed a knife. Tomorrow, the next chapter. He plunged it. Tomorrow you'll find out who. And anyway, but I, I, I don't think, uh, from what I've seen, I don't think long-form journalism in newspapers is, is, uh, in, in good, is healthy. Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't think yeah. the future's good. Uh, I, but, but I do think if it's got a future, it's in the digital world where the price of newsprint doesn't come into play. News holes in newspapers now are too tight to support the kind of, of, of stuff that, that uh, can. And frankly, I, when I was a reporter, uh, got our most satisfaction from. Actually, can I start out? I just, a show of hands. Does anyone here read Dig? Dig.com. It's a user-generated, like, it's a, it, comp it compiles news stories or, you know, anything, blogs, just pretty much any website that you can, and, it, and a lot of it, some, some of it is news, some of it's just, I don't know. Information is, is it done by how's it, how do they rank it's it like by a subject? It's or? it's uh, user generated, so like people can uh, like if you like a story, you can dig it. It's up. a social rating. Yeah, and site. so yeah. so it gets if it gets rated up, it, if it's popular, then it goes to the top and it comes to the front page. Um, I guess the reason I, th I think a lot of the people that raise their hands were probably younger people, um, and that's your future market. Um, first of all, to make the point of uh, like w how things are changing. Look at like music. Um, it used to be you'd buy a CD. You know there might be 15 songs on the CD. You hate all but one or two of them, and you pay 15 bucks or, or whatever for the CD. Now you buy the song, 99 cents. Uh, you forget about the other stuff. So, I mean, news. I mean, it seems like it's moving toward that. So. Um, yeah. Sometimes, you know, if, if you're an organization that's going to be putting out news, uh, real news, uh, you know, you're probably going to have to bite the bullet on some things until you hit those ones that actually bring in the money. But, um, you know, it's going to happen. It's not going to stop. You know, news is going to be uh, demanded, and there are going to be people who are going to read it. Um, but 
the, deli <coughs> the delivery mechanism, I think, is what's changing so and that we've been talking about so much, um, going from newspapers, um, and they're on the slope down. Meanwhile, we're in this middle ground where you can't afford to print a newspaper, but you can't afford to, uh, you know, put it on online and actually pay, pay your bills uh, for, for the newspaper that's failing, too. Um, so we're in this middle ground. But what about, um, you, uh, what was it? Um, so uh, let's see, Steve, you mm -hmm. talked about mobile, um, you know, m mo ways of spreading information through uh, mobile devices. Mm -hmm. Like I saw you had an iPhone. I do, yes, um, and a CrackBerry. I'm a real <laughs> <Wow>. loser. <laughs> okay, so what what's wrong with mobile applications? I mean, why can't we implement something like this through mobile applications? Uh, I I'm actually a senior in MIS. I'm not even journalism. Uh, I'm started. I just I'm starting a company right now uh, that I'm going to specialize in mobile applications. Um, so why why won't this work? I mean, uh, a lot it, of people it, say it why will. it won't. It, it, it will. Uh, as Dr. Bruget has said, uh, the technology is, a, is an important part of the solutions, and, and you may be helping us uh, find a way to, to deliver uh, news, information, advertising, content, uh, other, other sort of commercial connections. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, if, if people are communicating using these things, we need to figure out what's the model for giving them news and information. And on June 12th last year, when uh, my city was underwater in a flood that went beyond the 500-year level, uh, we, we sent out, um, I think it was 19 different breaking news text alerts saying this bridge was closed, that, ro that road was closed, and so on, and, and heard tremendous uh, response from our community that that was exactly the news that they needed. They loved our print edition the next morning, uh, the, the, the best newspaper I've, I've been a part of producing in, in 38 years in this business. And, and we, we got it delivered to everybody who wasn't underwater. And, but that was too late to tell people this bridge is closed, that road is closed. So absolutely mobile is an important part of the future. I, I just want to point out, though, if, if that's the standard, if we're just going to produce stories based on, like music, based on what people want, Watergate would have died. People did not want to read about President Nixon's legal problems during Watergate. It was, it was the, it was the uh, decision of the editors, new, mostly newspaper editors, because they were leading the charge, to continue doing those stories under great pressure and uh, from people who didn't want to read about it anymore. So who's, are we just, if we're just going to go by popularity, a lot of those stories aren't going to be told. Yeah, and, and I want to answer both, because a lot of people don't understand that I'm an editor of a journalism social network. And I'm an advisor, and I had an interesting conversation just the other day with Fabrice Florin of Apple, who created Shockwave. And another person on that, another advisor, is Howard Rheingold. I took Howard Rheingold to task on all of his books, and there we are trying to advise this social network. He told me to turn my 64-page how-to news writer into 200 words, because the demographics show that those users of our social network don't have the attention span to get beyond 200 words. Some arguments are complex. Some arguments, I'm not winning this argument because mine's a very complicated argument. It, it, it takes all these truths and says they are right, but there are other truths too. So my job now is to turn a journalism education into 250 words. And I'm gonna try. I'm not gonna not try. But the fact of the matter is, is that's the new reality. And finally, the the people who speak most eloquently about new media are those who are legatories of a literary education. And they forget how many books they've <coughs> read, they forget how many letters they've written, they forget how many uh, Excel sheets they've looked at, they forget how many critical thinking. These are the ones who are promoting new media without necessarily understanding that this generation uses mobile communication more than any other life function except breathing. And here's an interesting question. Anybody here been broken up with on chat or text? <laughs> look, look at this. Look how cold this is. Raise your hand. You've been broken. So when you hold up your cell phone, be careful there. 
Somebody didn't have the, 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 <laughs> the yeah. courage to look sure. you in the eye, or maybe you didn't have the courage to look someone there, and you said, I broke up, I break up with you? Did that happen? Did do you have that person's number? Let's give him a call. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I, did this, I did this at Boone, uh, at DMAC, and it was a very interesting occasion. Let's call him up, and let's find out why you spend so much time on text, and you, it, that's cold, man, don't you think? It's, it's cold. And how many other people have had a similar experience? Raise your hand. Don't be afraid. I will call them up. I promise I will call them up. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it's how they're using the, and dig. The most popular stories are, you know, ones that we wouldn't be reading. And if you're going to give things away for free, Steve, let's, let's start with some free things. Give away your obituaries for free. Cover 4-H. Bring families back into the newsroom. The things that we charge for a local newspaper are outrageous. I remember one time when that happened. So I'm not going to talk about this anymore, but that's the issue. I have to turn my book, which is 64 pages, and I thought that was slim, into 200. Shut up. Okay, we're going to take a few more questions. Um, I'd like to kind of come back to content. <laughs> I, I know that, that everybody's been more interested kind of in the technology. And Ken, I'd like to talk to you about citizen journalists. Um, and who really is qualified and not qualified to cover the news? Having come from print and now d online, and I uh, get into situations where I, I can't get a uh, pass to, want to cover the cyclones, for example, because of NCAA rules, all right, because I'm strictly online. <laughs> and yet I have been able to employ at various times, including when I was still at the register, a citizen journalist who did great coverage, and after uh, he left me, he went on to write for Cyclone Nation, okay, dot com. So all of these people here are training, or at least they think they're being trained to be journalists, but there are a lot of people at this university themselves who walk around with PhDs who are perfectly capable of writing a pretty balanced article. And so I, I'd like your more thoughts from all of you. Angie, when somebody is out there getting that video that you haven't gotten on the scene yet, or, and, and for, um, I know in Cedar Rapids, if somebody gets there before Jeff Rash, is he still doing your mobile journalism? Sure, yeah. But yeah, look, can we talk about the people who are qualified to do that and yet have, don't have a degree? Well, anybody's qualified. I don't have a degree. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's a matter of having a degree, but I think I've got a background in... in what it means to be try to get both sides and that sort of thing, and I don't, I don't, ha I don't belong to any political groups. That I don't have a uh, a hidden agenda, and some of these other folks, I'm not sure that they they don't. I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to the whole concept. I'm just saying, I think, I think basically it's another way to get, not to have to pay much. I don't know what you paid your citizen journalist, but usually I think that the idea now is that you, they use these people more like volunteers. I, I want, I want reporters to get paid. I pay the one I can afford. Oh uh, sure. Yeah, you, I have it. Uh, you, you mentioned Jeff Rash, an outstanding Iowa State grad. Thank you for sending Jeff our way. Um, it, and Jeff does a, an outstanding job and, and, and covers most of our breaking news, but he doesn't always get to the scene as quickly. And, and this week we had a car fire, not big news, but it was big news to people who saw it, uh, that, that somebody uploaded their cell phone picture, I presume it's a cell phone picture, of the, the fire with, with the flame still going uh, into our block talk uh, uh, hyper local tool where, where you could put it on the exact location and people in that neighborhood could click and see, oh, that's what the, all the smoke was or whatever. Not a big story, um, but they got there when, the, when it was still flaming and Jeff was covering something else or, or maybe we lost that day, I'm not sure. But it's not as good as Jeff getting there and doing picture, video, and story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, th I think that we want to, uh, we need to verify, you know, or qualify what things are, uh, are coming from what sources. You need to watch out that, uh, uh, that you're not presuming that, that people don't have a stake in the, the user content that they contribute. You know, the, the or, or be transparent about it. The difference is, you, you know this guy. You hired him. Would you take somebody who came off the street and says, I've got a story, print it? No. Okay. I mean, that's, 
The other thing, David Simon, uh, who was the creator of The Wire, worked at the Baltimore Sun, wrote an essay recently in the Washington Post, which is really good, talking about, he saw a little blurb in the Baltimore Sun about a, a shooting where a policeman had killed somebody, and they didn't name the policeman, and he thought that was outrageous, and he went and decided he was going to find out who it was and what the deal was. He, as he pointed out, there weren't any citizen journalists or bloggers out looking for that information uh, th to do that kind of work. I'm not sure they're actually doing the sort of watchdog uh, we're going to make you uncomfortable work that, that newspaper journalists and do, it, and action journalists. And as I recall from reading that, one of the things he pointed out, with the, the reason they didn't get the name was where the Baltimore Sun used to have four or five cop reporters, yeah. it was down to one or two. And so you weren't getting you know, it wasn't just the citizen journalists not finding information, the actual paid journalists didn't get it either. But anyway, I, I think just they're voting with their feet here. We're I guess just to quickly add to that, when you talk about that content element, especially from our perspective in capturing that video, I don't think that's necessarily anything new for a television newsroom um, in terms of getting that content, but it's new in the way that we're receiving it. Um, I mean, I can remember being sent to locations, you know, to uh, someone out in a rural area who had their shaky video camera um, capturing a tornado and we would go and try to find a way to take their VHS and make it compatible to what we are. Today it's so much easier because they can upload that video, shoot it to us and we can put it on the air, put it on the web within minutes. So I think that is what's changed. I still think um, whether it be video, whether it be uh, something that a citizen has looked into and wants <coughs> us now to then pursue as a news story, that's in a, in a lot of ways, the same thing that we have been doing for a long time. It's just how are we getting that information? How is it being delivered to us? I guess is what I may add to that. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and have two more questions, and then I would like to invite you all to enjoy some refreshments over here and continue the conversation afterwards with these four, who I'm sure would be more than willing to hang around and listen to your chat, right? Sure. All night. You got like four hours. <laughs> you can Twitter me. <laughs> All right, as we're running did. out of time, um, we've talked about all these mediums, um, including internet, um, TV. Nobody said anything about radio. That was our first um, primitive technique of reaching many people at one time, um, aside from word of mouth or like a telegram. Um, would you predict a return of radio? Because if I was driving down the road and some world disaster was had happened and I was listening to the music, a news reporter could come on the radio and tell however many people it was broadcasting to what just happened within maybe a matter of 20 minutes. Do you predict a return of this ancient technique or do you think it will eventually die out? Well, I, I, sh I should point out for say to sake of factual accuracy that, that newspapers have been around a lot longer than radio when you talk about primitive technology. But um, uh, Every form of media, uh, we're all being disrupted. And, and radio is being disrupted by satellite radio. It's being disrupted by iPods. Um, my wife, Mimi, sitting in the audience here, never listens to the car radio. She plugs in her iPod and listens to her music. And you can come on and w with a breaking news flash on the radio, and she is not going to catch it. Uh, she does get it off Twitter. That is true. Uh, <laughs> and. And so all media are being disrupted and need to need to innovate and f and and provide value. E even if people aren't paying for our content, they pay with their attention. We, if we're not providing value, they're not going to give us time. Uh, and so uh, radio, television, uh, you know, news websites, newspapers, magazines, uh, every form of, of media right now, uh, we're, we're all being disrupted. I do not think there will be a return of radio journalism uh, for the simple reason that the corporations that own them don't want to pay for reporters. And, and, and the truth is a whole lot of radio journalism was reading the newspaper anyway. That's true. I started my they career. Were, they were the first Google. Uh, in, in fact, we had a story last or week before last where the radio station in Iowa City was reading Diane Helt, uh, uh, Gazette reporters' tweets from the courtroom in the Curtis when the Curtis Fry verdict was being read. So they've gone from reading our stories to reading our tweets. Just quickly, I did start my career in radio. Uh, it was not that long ago, and it was for an all news network over in Cedar Rapids, um, previously owned by the Gazette Company, and I spent probably about a year there. 
um, and it wasn't long after that that it went to a completely sports radio generated format. I don't think it was all that long ago now that the station was sold and I think most of its content is generated by syndication. So I would have to say no, I just, I don't feel like I've been doing this for um, all that long, but long enough to see, you know, how I started my career, um, a station no longer exists. Uh, a lot of the times when, uh, during your individual 10 minute segments, you talked about uh, what the consumer wants, how many hits you got, uh, a lot about what, what individuals were reading. Um, and a lot of this centered around sensationalist stories where it wasn't necessarily news in itself, more like breaking stories about car fires. I mean, I don't, I don't maybe that is news, but I mean, news in, in my individual sense would be more of like stuff that I can't, I can't see it directly, but I want to know about. And I mean, maybe some people want to know about car fires, but I would rather not. I, more about <coughs> when I think of like what this day is about, First Amendment, or not today, but I guess tomorrow, First Amendment Day, um, I guess I rely on freedom of the press to get me news about the government. And a lot of what I consider to be like the, the news stories that people want that generate hits on a website or that people buy newspapers for doesn't really generate facts about the government uh, stories or even not even government stories at all anymore. More about just things that people experience in their lives that people other people may find interesting. So, I mean, coming from that, do you think that the freedom of the press is like a an aged concept? I mean, not many citizens feel that they need to exercise their freedom of press or to utilize other people's freedom of press to, to find stories that, albeit not as in interesting or exciting, but maybe necessary to keep our government in check as, fr as the First Amendment does in some people's opinion? If I could throw a question back to you, do you feel in the, the news that you value, that you seek out, um, are you in the majority or in the minority, do you believe? Of what? I'm of sorry. those who are seeking that hard-hitting news? Uh, the minority. Okay. No. And I think that's probably the challenge because um, I'm also a lecturer here on campus and I start off my classes a lot of times in the morning by asking students, hey, what's going on in the news today? And I get a lot of blank stares sometimes. And um, I thought it was pretty telling this semester when I asked that question and it was right around the time of uh, the whole Chris Brown, Rihanna. We had about a 20 minute discussion in my class on that. And everyone knew about that. And so um, I'm not saying good or bad, but it was very telling to me then when I would bring up something that I felt was that city government or that major issue that surely this would be of prominence in, in terms of that you know, news interest and it didn't register or it didn't even you know, come up as, as something they had heard about or they'd been following. Um, so I guess that I think is, is the challenge um, and what we do is that I just don't think a lot of people are always seeking that. I don't know if that answers your question. But. I, I think that um, in 2007, the Washington Post, which Ken, Ken already mentioned their outstanding uh, reporting during the Watergate era, uh, when many of you were not born, uh, but what will bring it back closer to home. In 2007, the Washington Post had one of the most outstanding years in the history of journalism. Um, th they won six Pulitzer Prizes. And three of them were for watchdog reporting on the government, on uh, Vice President Cheney's po uh, role behind the scenes in the Bush administration, on the, the Blackwater scandal over in, in Iraq, and on Walter Reed. There were three other Pulitzers they won for their coverage of Virginia Tech uh, massacre, a, a, you know, a great breaking news coverage. Uh, Steve Perlstein's economic commentary, which certainly had some some uh, aspects of government uh, watchdog in, in some of the things that he commented on, and then Gene Weingarten's fabulous feature writing. Uh, that was clearly one of the best years in the history of modern journalism. They, uh, like I said, they won the six Pulitzer Prizes. The only time anyone's ever won more Pulitzers than that was the New York Times for their 9-11 their coverage. In that same year, Advertising revenue at the Washington Post declined by, in print, advertising revenue in the Washington Post declined by $77 million. 
online advertising revenue grew by $6 million. Now, I know there's a lot of journalists in the audience here, so let me help you with the math. That's a net advertising loss of $71 million. If we want to continue the kind of watchdog reporting that you're talking about, we have to figure out the business model of the future of journalism and whatever platforms it's delivered in. The business model is more important than the technology because ex good, good journalism is expensive. citizen is interested in? I mean, do you think people will pay for that, or do you think no, they're I, only going to put don't. money towards uh, I, I, stories? The Washington Post, in print and online, gets a bigger audience now than they did during the Watergate reporting. What we need to do is figure out how to serve the businesses that want to reach that audience. The Washington, but, but the Washington Post's audience is totally different from the, or, as well as the oh, New York sure, Times. Sure, sure. Almost every other newspaper. In the Absolutely. Country. But to answer your question, I, I don't think people are willing to pay. We've, we've told them they don't have to. The we've Washington, taught it for years and years. We've told them the value of what we're providing is not worth anything. It's free, which, I mean, which is what goes to it. So you don't have to pay. Now we're coming back and saying, wait a minute. Now we'd like some money for it. Can you pay us? And people are saying, no, I don't want to pay. I'm, I'm, not, I'm used to not paying. There are enough people like you out there, most editors think, who are interested in paying for the kind of in-depth governmental watchdog news uh, that you are. Ken, they never paid the cost of gathering the news. They just paid the cost of having it delivered to their door and printed. Well, I'm not paying anything. I know. So, well, I well mean, then, then but, but what there I'm was a value to it. If I'm a customer at home and I'm paying $20 a month for the paper, I'm saying there's some value to what I'm getting. We but, told you we don't even need that money anymore. Angie, was, Angie was right. How much time do we spend with television? And, oh, it's a bad and example. Bad no, example. it's not. I pay for CNN. I pay for Fox News. I pay for MSNBC. I pay for HBO. People pay for TV all the time. They don't pay for the local news, although I get it through the cable system. If I want in-depth national news, I'm paying for it. Okay, but, but before cable came along, it was free. You still don't pay for the individual. Cable is just paying for... The, the delivery, it's not paying I'm, for It's paying, for the how do you think CNN gets its money? They sell advertising. They also get, they get cable revenue. They, they get some cable revenue, but it, it, it's not paying for the content. It's pay, Steve, you ignorant slut. No, <laughs> <laughs> that was, a, you guys are too young to know that Saturday Night Live skit. No, nah, they see it on the reruns. <laughs> <laughs> they laughed. <laughs> that was good. Well, well, thank you very much. Let's give this uh, panel a good round of applause. We don't have to do our let, We don't have to conclude. Let, 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 let's give a hand also to, to, to Dr. Dr. Brugea and, and, and Marcia and everybody else who's put this in. Yeah, let's have a hand for Steve for recognizing those people. And, yeah. <laughs> now, Rasha and uh, Mark Witherspoon, the advisor of the Iowa State Daily, the best student newspaper in the country, according to SPJ, is going to uh, give a brief... They're going to have a little uh, award ceremony. Take it away. No? The red light's on. Yeah. I can see the red light. Are we on? No. Okay. Uh, now it's off. I don't need, I don't need, I don't need the mic. Okay. Um, the, uh, we want to um, thank uh, some people. Uh, thank you with uh, uh, verbally. Uh, we thank you with plaques. Um, cool. Uh, and the, on these plaques are um, what we consider uh, one of the greatest um, awards we can give here at, at the Green School, and that's Champion of the First Amendment. So I'd like to give a Champion of the First Amendment Award to Michael Bushea. <laughs> Steve Buttry. Kim Fusen, <laughs> Kelly Eagle, That's me. That's me. and Angie Hunt. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Please thank all of our speakers. Remember, there's cookies and cookies. food, and you hung out for a while. You guys, you guys deserve a plaque for hanging out the whole time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, hey, that, like was that was fun. That was fun. That was fun. All I got to tell you.